I'm sure looking forward to part six today in our Uncommon People series. We're going to talk about God's call to collaboration. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, God made you so different? Would you go ahead and tell him that? Man, some of you said that with such conviction this morning, right? But we're going to see from God's word how to make that a good thing most of the time. And why we should be really grateful for that, not frustrated by that, which we can easily become. But before we get into God's word, let's say our series prayer together. Would you say it with me? Lord, what we know not, teach us. What we have not, give us. What we are not yet, make us. That your goodness may flood our world through your church doing your will. Amen. We're going to talk today about a really feel-good word, and we're going to learn why a lot of people long for what we're talking about this morning, but there are very few people who really learn to live in the blessing of what we're going to learn about today. And I'm talking about the word collaboration. Collaboration is defined as the action of working with someone to produce or to create something. And there are many meaningful things in our life that we want to experience that the truth is we can't create those things alone and we can't enjoy those things alone. For instance, you can't have a family by yourself, can you? You have to have people with you if you're going to enjoy a good family. And the same is true of companies, the same is true of God's church, that we have to learn to collaborate if we're going to create what causes us to enjoy what our heart is longing for. And we're going to see God's perspective on collaboration in Genesis chapter 11, where the Bible says that some people had built this beautiful tower in a place called Babel, and the Bible says that God looked down at what they did, and then the Lord himself said that if one peop- as one people speaking the same language they had begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do is going to be impossible for them. Now that word one people is an interesting phrase, right? How do you get people, and how do you make people one? Well, there's only one way, and that is we have to understand the skill of collaboration and what collaboration does is collaboration brings capacity and the capacity that collaboration brings causes things that were impossible without the collaboration to become possible through the collaboration and I think it's interesting that the very last recorded prayer we have of Jesus in Gethsemane's garden whenever he was praying for his church shortly before he was going to be captured and he was going to be crucified, Jesus prayed, Father, I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. In other words, he wasn't just praying for the first century church that he founded, but he was praying for all of us who are believers here today. And Jesus prayed that all of us may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I'm in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. So we can see that collaboration really is something, man, it takes God's help. How do you make all the believers become one in God's sight? But the price is worth the difficulty that we may go through because the price is wherever collaboration happens well, Jesus said there are going to be a lot of people who end up becoming believers in God. Now, I shared this backdrop this morning because the story that we're going to study today is a story that you're going to say, why in the world would God make this happen or allow this to happen to two people? How many of you have ever heard the story of Ananias and Sapphira? Can I see your hand? If you've read the story, if you heard the story, it's a story you're never going to forget because these two people have a piece of land and they sell it and they decide they're going to give a part of this land to God. 
God, and then they lie about how much they gave, and because they lie, Peter, who's their pastor, is told by the Holy Spirit to talk to them about it, and when he does, they immediately fall dead because of how they lied. Now, one pastor called that being slain in the Spirit. I don't think that's being slain in the Spirit. I think that's being slain by the Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? Or, or truly, it's probably being slain by an evil spirit because that's what happens whenever we don't obey God is we give place to the enemy to begin destroying things that are truly so valuable in our lives. And it's why God wants us to understand collaboration. You remember we picked up last uh, message and we were talking about how whenever the church started reaching people that it experienced incredible persecution and there was a lame beggar who for over 20, over 40 years had been begging at the temple and God healed him. And we saw that Peter didn't mention words whenever he was talking to the people after that miracle, but he talked about how they handed Jesus over to be killed, and they disowned Jesus before Pilate, even though Pilate had decided to let Jesus go free. And he said, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you, and you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this. So think about it. You're talking about people who from the time they were little children, they were taught to look for the Messiah, and they were given all these signs so they would recognize the Messiah whenever he came. But they were so out of touch with God. The collaboration of their hearts concerning God was so out of touch that when Jesus came the first time, there were people who literally shouted crucify him instead of honoring the reason Jesus Christ came to the world. So that's how, how out of touch even a religious heart can get with God. And this chapter in chapter 4 is really about the fact that God calls his people to collaboration with him. We can see it in Acts 4, verse uh, 23, whenever it says this, that, that Peter and John went back after being in prison for preaching the gospel, and it says they preached to their own people, and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So you notice that we're learning in this chapter that there's persecution, but God cares about his people standing together in the midst of the persecution because collaboration can accomplish what can't be accomplished by one person in their own strength. And then we get to Acts 4.32, and it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind, and no one claimed any of the possessions were their own, but they all shared everything that they had. So God is making something very clear, and that is his church was collaborative. And because the church was collaborative, they were praying, and the Holy Spirit was moving among them. And they were working together, doing things that they couldn't have done if they were living in a place of disunity, and that's the, the, the background that God sets up as he begins to tell us this story about Ananias and Sapphira. There's another thing we should probably notice, and it's in Acts 4, verse 36, before we come into Acts 5, which is the story of Ananias and Sapphira, and that is the Bible says that there was another person, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means means sons, son of encouragement, and he had sold a field he owned, and he brought the money, and he put it at the apostles' feet. So can you see that God is contrasting two leaders? He's contrasting Barnabas, and he's contrasting this couple named Ananias and Sapphira. And, and you may think it's really harsh what God did, but I want to read you something that James, the Lord's brother, wrote in James chapter 3, because sometimes people will say, you know, I, I wish I was called to the ministry. I wish I was called to be a Bible teacher because it would be so wonderful to stand before the people and have God's anointing in my life. But listen to what James, the half-brother of Jesus, said about that in James 3.1. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach are going 
to be judged by stricter, stricter standards. And in my opinion, that's what was happening to Ananias and Sapphira, that when you're called to lead, your example matters because your example affects a lot of people. And when, you, when you're called to teach, what you teach matters because a lot of people's lives are affected by the things that you teach. So when we see a story like this, we should first say to ourselves, now God doesn't kill every single person who lies in church or else the church would dwindle overnight. Can you say amen? So this isn't something God does commonly, but God in this story, he tells us something and it's because God wants us to see that collaboration makes things happen, but whenever we quit valuing collaboration the way that God calls us to, allow, to, to, to value collaboration, things begin to die because we don't value the collaboration that Jesus himself prayed for us to walk in. Can you say amen? The early church prevailed in the first century for three reasons. Number one, they lived with such pure hearts. Number two, they spoke truth to power. And number three, they withstood the persecution that they were facing. And this morning, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on persecution because I want to talk to you about collaboration in your homes and things that are going on with your kids that God can move if we quit fighting and looking for our own way and we really seek the Lord's help and we begin to work together instead of working against each other. I want to talk to some of you about your companies and how important it is that, that, that you build a culture that causes people to honor unity. Because if you don't have unity, it really doesn't matter how hard you work at something. Without unity, we can't accomplish the things that we accomplish whenever there's collaboration in the group of people that we're a part of. And, and uh, we do have to speak truth to power. I think this text is very relevant to the American church today because I think we can see that evil is fighting our country. And there are values that have been robbed from our country that once we would have never believed it, y'all. I mean, I never believed that I would turn on the Olympics and one of our major networks would have drag queens who were mocking the Lord's Supper. I never dreamed I'd live to see a day like that. I never dreamed I'd live to see a day whenever some of our states would have drag queens come to public school assemblies and they would honor them as heroes. But listen, this is the good news. If the church stands up and if we do what the early church did and we, we talk to our neighbors about Christ and we love their kids and we have an explosion of healing, how many of you know there's nothing wrong with America that what is right with God can't fix in the hour that we're in? Amen? But collaboration is going to play a key part of that. I, I think back to Martin Luther King Jr., who was led to, to drive some terrible darkness from our country. And he wrote something in what was a, uh, what's a famous letter. It's called his letter from the Birmingham jail. And he wrote this just five years before he paid the price with his own life to, to see God do what God did through his life. And he said this, if today's church doesn't recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, it will forfeit the loyalty of millions, and it will be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. In other words, if the church doesn't get it that we're here to stand for what God stands for. And standing for what God stands for always means standing for people because there's nothing God stands for more than people. And the reason I stand for truth isn't so people think I'm smarter than other people, but the reason I stand for truth is because I love people and I don't want lies to destroy people's lives. Can you say amen? So let's look this morning at why collaboration is so essential to our fulfilling God's purpose. And number one, it's because collaboration creates unity in our hearts. 
This story tells us in Acts 5 that this man named Ananias was together with his wife Sapphira and they sold a piece of property and with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back a part of the money for himself, but he brought the rest and he put it at the apostles' feet. Now again, let's look at the contrast where we see this guy named Barnabas whose heart is totally wanting to live in, in collaboration with the Holy Spirit, totally wanting to do God's will. He's totally honored by the apostles and he has the apostles speaking good over his life. And then you have Ananias and Sapphira who, you know, they're kind of half-heartedly serving God and God is showing us that things die whenever we live in that place. How many of you know the word die vision simply means there's two visions? And what happens when there's two vision is, is the best vision, which is the collaborative vision, is going to die whenever we end up getting into die vision. And, and the first thing I think we should know about uh, collaboration is collaboration is always going to cost us something first. You know, we can see what it costs us in Ephesians chapter 4 when we're told to be completely humble and gentle to be patient, bearing with one another in love, and to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So you notice what the cost of collaboration is. Number one, I have to be humble instead of being haughty and thinking I'm right about everything. I have to be gentle instead of being harsh. Because when I'm gentle, what I'm saying is, you matter to me. Your views matter to me. Your desires matter to me. And, and so I want to listen to you. I, I'm, I'm not trying to just get my way in this circumstance. And then the Bible says we're patient. Why are we patient? Well, I can tell you that I have the same best friend since I've been 20-some years old. And you know why we're still best friends? It's not because every one of us have done everything perfect in every season of life. We're best friends because we know God called us to be together to help each other experience God's best in our life. And because of that, there are times we've all been patient with one another to stay in the relationship that we're in. And let's face it, have you noticed that we live in a society where very few people are living in the benefits of long-term love? Very few people are living in the benefits of long-term love in their marriages, in their friendships, in their place of employment. And it's because we live in a consumer culture, we don't live in a collaborative culture. But a collaborative culture is so much better. You say, why? Well, listen to what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3, verse 7. He said, husbands, I want you to learn to live considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so nothing will hinder your prayers. So do you know what a, a lack of collaboration does? A lack of collaboration causes our prayers not to be answered. A lack of collaboration causes things to be hindered. Again, because collaboration increases capacity. And whenever you increase capacity, the impossible can start happening in your life. There are things in my life I can't experience unless I'm in collaboration with, with God because it takes God's wisdom to bring those things to pass in my life. There are things I, I, I want to believe for in my life I can't experience unless I have Tamara's perspective because she sees something about the circumstance that I'm in. So first of all, I want to encourage you that collaboration will cost you something as a person. Did you ever hear about the man whose wife was kind of upset with him and she said, Honey, why do you speak to me so harshly? And he said back, Well, sweetheart, it's the only way I can get a word in edgewise. How many of you know what he's talking about, right? And, and in your relationships, you're either combative and you're fighting for your own way, but people who have the wisdom of God say, no, I don't want to be combative. I want to be collaborative. Now, here's the second thing that we need to know about collaboration that's essential to God bringing his best into our life. And that is collaboration creates giving hands. See, when you want to collaborate with the Holy Spirit and when you want to collaborate with people, 
you want to give because you want what we can experience, not just what me can experience through the things that I have. And that was Ananias' problem. The Bible goes on to say in verse 3 that Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart and you've lied to the Holy Spirit and you've kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? And then verse 4, he said, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? See, this is how we can know that the early church wasn't socialistic. They weren't asking people to sign everything that they owned over to the church to be a part of the church. But Peter said, this is your land. It was your money. But what I want you to get in touch with Ananias is, why are you lying why aren't you just telling me the truth? And why aren't you joyfully giving yourself to the church the way that you should? And you know what? There's a lot of reasons in our heart today. Some of us can say, I can tell you why I don't trust a man. I've been hurt so many times that I don't ever want to trust anybody again. I can tell you why I don't go to church anymore. I've been hurt so many times that I, I don't know I want to trust the church again. Now, for me, I was a part of three churches. The first church wasn't very healthy, but the next two were very healthy, and they changed my life. And here's what I would say to you. I would say that the answer to going through things that have made you not collaborative is not for you to resist God's will for your life. It's for you to choose better in your life so you receive what God's intention is. Can somebody say amen? So for some of us, we may say, I'm not collaborative. I feel like I have good reasons. But listen, what God did was he said, the church isn't going to overcome this persecution unless they're collaborative and they work together. And so sometimes in Scripture, you know, we, we can't build a doctrine around everything that we read, right? For instance, you ever hear about the guy who was praying, he was really discouraged. He said, I'm going to point my finger in the Bible. And sometimes we do that, and we get a good scripture, right? Maybe you've done it, and it said, take heart. The Lord's with you. And you thought, man, God was speaking to me. But one guy did that, and the first time he pointed in the Bible, it said Judas went and hung himself. The second time he pointed in the Bible, it said, go and do thou likewise. How many of you know that was not God, right? And not everything in the Bible is something that you build a doctrine around. But sometimes God will do things, especially with leaders, and he's sending a signal. And that is, I want you to think more deeply about this. And my message this morning is not a rah-rah message. My message is more of a sobering message this morning. And here's what God wants you to think about. Every time that you choose consumerism over collaboration, something is going to die in your life. Every time you choose to, to choose your way over the Lord's way, you just kill God's better will for your life. Every time you choose to distance yourself from a relationship that God called you to, listen, all the benefits of that relationship, all the prayers that God was going to answer because of that relationship are affected. Now, I'll be honest with you this morning. I had to learn to want to be a person of collaboration. When I first heard in my church that God wanted me to give him the first part of my day to read the Bible and to pray, I would get up and I'd try. But how many of you know five minutes of prayer when you don't know what you're doing can seem like a really long time, can it? And, and so finally I realized, well, if I'm not liking prayer, probably what I should do is I should spend this time learning how to pray until I start seeing there's value to prayer. Now I can tell you I never come to the end of a year without uh, thinking, God, man, this, this year, if I would not have had my time with you, I would have missed out on so many answers to prayer if I didn't honor your word and, and honor my time in prayer with you. Or, or coming to church the first day of the week. You know, it's easy to be sporadic, but can I tell you something? When you commit to it, what happens is God centers your life every Sunday when you come to church. And then you start your week centered in God. And then when things are coming up with the kids and things are coming up at work, how many of you know our God is sovereign, which means he can show himself bigger than the stuff the enemy's up to in our life? Is anybody grateful for that this morning? And what collaboration 
does whenever we value collaboration is, first of all, it keeps our heart in unity with God, with people. The second thing it does is it creates a giving heart. You want to give God the first part of your day. You want to give God obedience in your life. And that begins to change everything in our lives. And here's the third thing that collaboration will do. Why it's so important is that is collaboration causes us to honor what we hold dear in our hearts. Let's finish the story. The Bible says about three hours later, Sapphira, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. One pastor said, that Sapphira came in from Sephora. Some of you know what he's talking about, right? Maybe she was out shopping those three hours. But Peter asked her, he said, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that's the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they're going to carry you out too. And at that moment, she fell down at his feet, and she died then the young men came in, and finding her dead, they carried her out, and they buried her beside her husband. And great fear, would you say that with me this morning? Great fear seized the church and all who heard about these events. Now, did you notice when Ananias died, what did the Bible say happened? Great fear seized all who heard what happened in verse 5. When Sapphira died, what happened in verse 11? Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Do you see why collaboration is so important in God's sight? Do you see what God's goal was in this circumstance? He wanted to teach people the prize collaboration because it's collaboration with God and good people that keeps God moving us forward in life. Let me give you some examples. Whenever lust is killed and love is nurtured in a relationship, how many of you know prayers are going to get answered? Can you say amen? Whenever laziness is killed in a heart and ambition and confidence and diligence are caused to, are caused to live, they're nurtured. How many of you know God's going to start answering prayer in that person's life, right? How many of you know whenever fear is killed through collaboration in somebody's heart. And faith is really, really strong in a person's heart. God's going to start doing really, really good things. And that's why Paul said, and I close with this in 1 Corinthians 11, he talked about the Lord's Supper. And he said, when you take the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11.30, he said, some of you, it's just a wafer. It's just a cup of juice. And you don't have the fear of the Lord. You don't, you don't have enough fear for the fact that God wants to work in your life and God wants to bless you. And he said, because you lack that fear and that desire to collaborate with God, he said, many among you are sick. Others are weak. Some of you have even died because you're not fearing the Lord. But here's the good news. He said, but if you'll let God start working in your heart and judge you, you won't come under the judgment of the enemy like Ananias and Sapphira did. How many of y'all want to live in the blessings of collaboration? You don't want to be killed because you aren't honoring God in your heart. Amen. Hey, can we give him good praise this morning? Can we do that? And I want to pray for you this morning. God, thank you for your word. God, thank you for the encouraging parts of your word. God, thank you for the challenging parts of your word. And God, thank you for our church family. God, thank you for making us one in heart. God, first today I pray for those who had a really, really hard week. And Lord, I just pray that this word, God, won't, won't challenge them, God, to the point where they feel like a failure. But God, I pray it will challenge them to fear you and to God to, to be grateful for your love. Lord, I thank you that when you lifted up the bread and you lifted up the juice, you made it so clear that your body was broken for us. And God, your blood was spilled out for us. God, if there's anybody we can count on to always be for us, God, we know we can count on you to always be for us. But God, 
We don't want to feel like a failure, but we don't want to fail you either. So God, I pray for collaboration. God, collaboration with your word, collaboration with the Holy Spirit. God, collaboration with our homes. God, let this be a season of answer prayer because of how collaboration happens. God, help our words bring us to unity, not division. God, help our actions bring us to unity, not division. And Father, in our country right now, I pray you'll unify the body of Christ. God, this is a dark season, and I pray you'll bring us together, and God will speak the truth in love. And Father, we pray, God, that we'll lift the enemy's work off our country, just as the first century church did. God, we thank you. You give us the power to do it. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. Well, if you're grateful for his word, would you give him a great big hand of praise this morning? And if you'd bow your heads, close your eyes with me, I want to do what we do regularly in, in our services here at Faith Family. And if you're new, it's rooted in Romans 10, verse 13, where the Bible says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I know there are a lot of people here this morning who say to me, you know, Jim, I want free of the guilt and shame of sin. I want forgiven of my sin. There are many who say to me, you know, Jim, I want freed from the power of sin. I'm tired of sin having its way in my life. There are other people who say, man, I'm living with unsatisfied desires, and I really want God to, to bless the future of my life. Can I tell you how that happens? Romans 10, 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But it's not just knowing about him. We can't just know he lived a great life. But it's when we know him, and make him Lord of our life, that his word starts making a difference in our lives. The power of the Holy Spirit starts making a difference in our lives. And if you're here today and you would say to me, you know, Jim, I want God to bring forth the best in my life. I'm ready to say no to sin and yes to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm going to count to three and all over this place, I just want you to shoot up your hand right, right where you're seated. And uh, we're going to call on the name of the Lord with you at your seat this morning. If you're ready for God to bring forth his best in your life, you ready? One, two, three. Shoot up your hand as a sign you want to be prayed for. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Awesome. God bless you. You say today, man, I'm ready. God bless you. Thank you, ushers. God bless you. Anybody else? You say today, I'm ready for God to bring forth his best in my life. Can I ask one more question? Maybe you're here, you say, you know, Jim, I served God at one time, but man, I strayed, and I'm ready to come back to the Lord. I, I don't want to live in what sin brings forth in my life. I want to bring, I want to live in what Jesus does. If that's you, would you shoot, shoot your hand up high too? If that's you today, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Awesome. God bless you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, church family, you can look up, and let's put our hand on our heart. Let's pray these words with those who lifted their hands. Let's say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for coming to earth so we'd know how real God's love is and how incredible God's ability to bless any life truly is. Today, Lord, I say no to sin and I say yes to you. Thank you for loving us when we weren't living right. Now, Lord, help me grow into who you know I can be. And when I mess up, help me always trust in your mercy and in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, so many people gave their heart to the Lord today. Can we... Can we give the Lord a big hand clap for that? Amen. And uh, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand with me. We're going to sing our closing song. But before we do, let me just say to all of you who prayed that prayer today, God has an incredible plan for your life. And, uh, you know, to help you get off to a great start, we have a gift for you today. It's in a white packet on our information walls as you go. 
And in the packet is a devotional 30 days to new beginning. There's some cards that will teach you how to start connecting with God through Bible reading and prayer. And also some cards that will help you connect with helpful people and helpful ministries that will help God's work be done well in your heart and in the lives of those you love too. So please grab that packet. Then I want to encourage you that Jesus said, believe, everybody shout believe, and be baptized. Everybody say be baptized. Has anybody noticed people are being baptized all across this country, man, at football game? I'm so glad. Man, prayers are working, and we're seeing so many baptized in our church too. And I like to say this, that in my 47 years of serving God, I know a lot of people who took a step of baptism, and then I watched them grow such strong, supernaturally blessed lives that amazes me. But I've really never seen a person who refused to be baptized, who, I I can't think of one, who refused, and they went on to live that same kind of life. Now, maybe I just don't know them, but there's a principle behind it, and that is baptism is the first step of obedience we take as Christians. And how many of you know it's obedience step by step that causes God to bless our life, amen? It's that obedience that changes everything. So we're going to be baptizing people in our anniversary service. Can't wait for that service. And I want to encourage those of you who prayed today, you can sign up. You can text baptism to that number. You can scan the QR code and register. Or if you have a pen, you can uh, grab a card on the seat back and you can sign up to be baptized. Can we give those who prayed another great big hand today?
let me encourage you the prayer partners are here for you if any of you have something in your heart it amazes me sometimes how you know we come for prayer and the holy spirit works through somebody man it encourages our faith so much want to let you know you might have noticed that you can register to vote if you're not registered to vote and you can register in our connection center we're going to do that this sunday next sunday as well how many of you know one of the ways god calls us to stand for good values is to vote right so we want to encourage every single believer to vote and to really make sure we're educated when we cast our vote right so well let me speak this blessing over you may the lord bless you may the lord keep you May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you. Thank you for being in his house today. Thanks so much for tuning in. It was an awesome service. I hope you were so blessed. And I hope you got to take down some really good notes that you can apply to your everyday life. We're so glad that you were here with us today. Hey, we want to say congratulations and how proud we are of you. If you gave your life to Jesus today or maybe you rededicated your life to Jesus today, congratulations. We're so excited for you. And we want to do our part to help set you up for a successful walk with Jesus. However, we may be a blessing to you. Please let us know in the chat. Our moderators are there ready to answer any questions you may have. But we want to be there for you. We want to help you experience everything that he has for you because he has amazing, amazing plans for your life. So we want to make sure you know we're in your corner and we're here for you. We love you guys so much. Also, don't forget about our upcoming events. We got Night on Main, September 22nd. It'll be in the evening downtown Victoria. It's going to be awesome. Bring your lawn chairs. Bring friends. We're going to have worship and food and games. It's going to be great. Also, we are celebrating 35 years, our 35th anniversary here at Faith Family Church. God has done amazing things, and he is continuing to do even more amazing things. And we're so glad that you're a part of that. We love you so much, church family. We hope you have the best week, and we'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye.